Hello. This is the first episode of the Working Hours podcast, and this is the second intro for it. I'm recording this intro as we're ramping up for another more intensive week of the coronavirus. There will be some discussion around this in later episodes. I'm hoping to interview people as this is still going on, um, just to see how it's affecting them and their work or their work search, anything to do with that kind of thing. This episode, however, was recorded back in November 2019 when everyone in Leeds also seemed to have a pretty horrible virus. Fortunately, myself and my first guest, Eleanor Snare, were not stricken with this at the time, that particular illness. Um, But enough from me for now. I want to try to keep these intros short, so without further ado, here's the first interview for the Working Hours podcast. It's on silent. It's in the other room. Yeah. What time is it? Ten. Ten o'clock. What time do you need to move to get buses and stuff? I don't need. Um. My, oh, you're not going now. They changed it because all the kids are rehearsing for nativity. Oh. <laughs> so last week and this week, I don't um need to go in. But when I'd gone in like the week before, I had to take them out of the nativity rehearsal, and you just don't realise how insane <laughs> it was. Like every one of them was holding this slip of paper with their line on. <laughs> And when they get up, it's like, oh, you know, Jane, get up. And she's like, Mary and Joseph went to the inn. There was no room at the inn. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all, like, petrified <laughs> and really excited. So, yeah, we don't have to go in because there's so much nativity <laughs> stuff going on at the moment. Which is quite sweet, really. Yeah. Well, it uh, adds a bit of a colour to the dark, dark winter seasons. <laughs> <laughs> I've been really enjoying it because I haven't been working... Like last year I was working and I, I, you know, you're getting up in the dark, you come mm. home in the dark, you don't really see much of the daylight, mm. um, and it's just a slog. Um, but actually not working through winter has been quite pleasant. When you have the... Just get up when you want, if it's quite nice, like mm. today, you just go for a wander outside, it's a nice crisp winter air, you dress for it appropriately, you when don't you... have to run around. Yeah, when you have the time in the day... But I guess that's it, is because, you know, the morning and the, the evening are encroaching. Really, our, our day, our shift of working should change. Like, I, I had a really good um, uh, speaker come to one of the events that me and my sister run, called Samantha Toon, and she kind of specialises in mindfulness and research and lots of different things. She does it on a corporate level. And one of the things she talked about was in winter how we don't change our working pattern. We mm. still work eight hours a day. But she was really, she said, really, it's like, if you worked five, you'd probably actually be a lot healthier, happier, because you'd be spending more time resting mm. and doing the things that your body needs mm. during winter. And I'd never really thought of that before, but um, it's definitely something that I want to look at for next year, is change, you know, change the pattern so that in summer, maybe you're, you're able to work a bit longer. It would seem sensible since plants and animals, the everything change, else is doing and it. They adapt. But, you know, super, super innovative, flexible capitalism <laughs> can't change. And, and like, when I was in Oz, it would just blow my mind that you'd have, it, like, boiling hot place, and you've got all these pasty white folk dressing mm. up in suits and getting on buses, getting in cars, doing nine to five. It's like, anywhere else where it's warm, they don't do this. They're more mm. sensible, they adapt to the environment. Yeah, it's bizarre. it's kind of like in Singapore, I guess, as well, when I was there. It's so humid, mm. but they've obviously got huge financial centres, and everyone's still wearing suits and stuff. Like, that, you're you're applying a kind of, I guess, a, in this instance, like a paradigm of what to wear to work and what's appropriate in a completely inappropriate situation. I think it's like suit, sweaty suits. It's quite suits. an interesting thing, because mm. it's a weird clothing because it doesn't seem like a lot of clothing you look at clothing we're talking complete nonsense <laughs> uh, you look at clothing there but you can see a sort of gradation like a mm. an evolution of them and the suit kind of just appears from nowhere mm. uh, you know. well there's a lot of like from a a fashion perspective in history with the suit the suit's got a lot of kind of elements of it which I guess were quite innovative of the time. So things like buttons, <laughs> you don't really think about how radical they were or zips. But before that, it's like everyone was just tying shit, shit together with rope. Yeah. 
And things like tailoring or just the fact that you can cut it bespoke was really quite, um, I suppose, quite exciting. I'd be interested to know where the kind of suit, the, the like two-piece suit as we know it and, and for a work capacity kind of properly emerged. Because I imagine it was earlier than we think. Yeah, it's had a very good run. It's been over 100 years for sure. sure. Definitely. But yeah, that kind of... Um, I find the suits quite an interesting... The subtlety in the suiting is really, you know, I'm really interested in fashion. The subtlety in suiting, I remember seeing Michael Caine talking about, he was on a program about Savile Row, which actually really interesting because they became a cooperative type thing. Mm -hmm. So years ago, like, um, I think it was in the 60s or 70s, a whole generation of men essentially rejected Savile Row because it was too reminiscent of their fathers and they were kind of rebelling. So during, I think, in the 70s maybe, I think it was, Savaro essentially all the tailors got together and said instead of being these independents we're going to come together and be like the Savile Row brand mm -hmm. to protect ourselves and essentially like revamp what we're doing so then you had people making suits for like the Rolling Stones and then you've got like Oswald Boateng going like who I think is amazing like the first black Savile Row tailor but they essentially joined together in their powers to market themselves as Savile Row we can you know we can go from classic to like new wave da 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 um, but Michael Caine in the show was saying that the thing about a good suit is no one would be able, no one can look at your suit and tell you why it's good. They'll just remember mm -hmm. that you are wearing a really good suit. Yeah. And like I always really liked that um, kind of the subtlety in a, you think a suit's just a suit, but actually there's so many small variations of what it, it can look like. We oh, are going yeah, off on like a tangent, but I'm... Power suits in the 80s. Yeah, but, mm. you know, it's... It's, it's work-related. interesting. Yeah, power <laughs> suits are, a front, like, a really interesting example of, uh, particularly in work, and, like, how we... If you see someone in a pinstripe suit, anyone can wear a pinstripe suit, but you immediately think, oh, well, he clearly works... He, more for a start... More serious person, yeah. yeah. it's a more serious person who clearly works in finance. Mm. It's like... No, he just, I don't know, he's going to court. <laughs> or, or he's a very good con man who's yeah. just going to take all your money, which is the same as working in finance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, we just started recording in the middle of this. I'm not very good at the hosting thing. You know, okay. I just kind of ramble on talking <laughs> nonsense. Um, Sound like a great podcast host, actually. <laughs> That's what they all do. Yeah, they talk far too much. <laughs> Yeah, right? Like, Shut up. I know it's your show, but I didn't come to listen to you. Um, so, uh, let's start with... Well, let's start with the silly question. What did you want to be when you grew up? What did I want to be when I grew up? Um, the thing that I wanted to be most when I grew up, and I still want to be, is an astronaut. Nice. And because... It's space. <laughs> it's space. It's because what I actually want to do is see the Earth from space. Mm. Um, I think there's something really, you know, every account of every astronaut I've ever read has been, it is life-changing. I remember someone said it's almost like you see God because you suddenly, your perspective, it kind of just radically changes you. So I've always wanted to be an astronaut and I'm kind of hoping that somehow I will be able to still go into space, maybe. So yeah, I wanted to be an astronaut. Um, I didn't really... When I was very young, I didn't really kind of think... You know, some kids have, like, I want to be a dentist, or, I mean, boring kids. No, that <laughs> dentists are really important. You know, I want to be a writer, I want to be this. I didn't really have that kind of urge. I was just very much focused on, like, just enjoying myself, yeah. like, well, as an adult. Um, <clears throat> and then I think as I kind of got older slightly, I realised that I really, I really wanted to be a teacher. Um, but... I was um, discouraged from doing that. Discouraged? Um, I remember I said to my dad, I really want to be a teacher. And he said, those who can do and those who can't teach. Which I think is probably one of the biggest lies that anyone kind of believes. But uh, lots of people have said things like that. And my dad had said it in a very kind of flippant, you know, just silly humour. Mm. Dad, dad joke way. Yeah. Um, I think probably not realising that impact it had um, on me, like it would any child who went to a parent and said, you know, I, I kind of think this is what I really want to do. Mm. Um, so I kind of not avoided it, but just didn't really engage with it, even though from that point on, all through my teenage years, 
um, and onwards I did a lot of teaching stuff so like volunteering um, private tutoring when I was at university did work experience at schools lots of different things like that I never really kind of went down the path of traditional teaching like PGCE and things like that right. so I really wanted to be a teacher and then um, I kind of as I got you know went through college and everything I just it's funny looking back I realised that I just didn't really know um, and a lot of what I did I just wanted, did whatever I wanted to do next so I did an art foundation because I liked it went to art college because I liked it went to do an MA because I thought it would be good and it was only when I kind of finally left education that I got you know a, a proper job in inverted mm-hmm. commas as in a job in an you know in a, an office nine to five um, that my my life kind of took a slightly different turn but I was never really like that um, driven by the concept of a job mm-hmm. it was more about what do I like doing mm-hmm. and what what could I how could I do that most of the time and someone could give me some money mm-hmm. rather than a job yeah which is the hard bit yeah that's yeah. kind of finding that out and um, it is a I think I've done quite a few different things which I imagine we'll talk about in a minute um, and they've all kind of coalesced into me understanding a bit more of what I like to do. But even now, I still struggle to sort of say a job title. I think our obsession with job titles is actually quite... Um, it's like a red herring. Because job titles basically can be really meaningless. They can be really useful if the job is well established and clearly kind of delineated in, say, a particular industry. But for a huge number of people, particularly in creative fields job titles just aren't really they're they're too inflexible for the the skills that are required or the things that you end up doing yeah under that job title or they get too long yeah <laughs> or they get too ridiculous I, I do this, 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 this. yeah it was like they called it um the, what did it, was it called like the slash generation mm-hmm. of like i'm a dj slash illustrator slash model slash da, 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 which is essentially just a list of skills but rather than a job title oh you're an odd job man. yeah which no one <laughs> yeah. no one would say that now but when I think about it I'm kind of like I kind of am that I'm a, I'm a digital bobber jobber <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah but you think no one you know you wouldn't say that now or you know that whole thing of what do you do or you know this and that mm. that kind of Del Boy type yeah. lifestyle but actually a lot of people do even I've been thinking now, like I was just selling loads of selling some stuff on eBay recently. Mm. Is that like a job? No, is it an income stream? Yes. So yeah. it's like, but am I going to put that on my well, CV? I just did a bit of retailing. And... Just do a bit of visual <laughs> merchandising. <laughs> but, but people, you know, and then there's people like kids say who maybe start up on Depop and they actually sell quite a lot and it becomes, but that becomes a, you know a viable business or viable income stream. But they are doing things like visual merchandising and social media content generation and SEO. They're doing all that. But if you said I sell on Depop, no one is going to say, oh yeah, you've learned all these skills. Mm-hmm. Whereas actually, it's about that's why I think the job title is kind of a bit. It has a use. Well, it's but not, it's not the be all and end all. Yeah, and it's how you can sell it because, you know, it's the whole transferable skills thing. Transferable skills, transferable mm. skills. You know, what you can use here, what can you use elsewhere, and not so much the qualifications, but the experience that you've mm. had, and how that can be turned into something else. But that's a very, I mean, you know, so I think that's a very neoliberal thing that's really embedded yes. in it. It's that whole sort of you are your own brand, live brand, mm. and you can. You can then turn your hand to all these different things because you're being that brand. Yeah. And that's kind of like, there are benefits to that. I think one of the greatest um, kind of, greatest and saddest achievements in a way of things of, you know, neoliberal capitalism is that it does have so many benefits that it's difficult to push against it. Mm. Um, Because a lot of people do want to do lots of different things and they don't want to be in a cradle to grave job. Um, and so they have this opportunity in our current economic climate to do that. However, there is then a kind of lots of things fall short. I had a conversation with my students the other day about being self-employed and one of them was like, oh, I really want to do it because, you know, I don't want to work for anyone else and I want to be my own boss. And I said, you know, well, 
There's no sick pay, there's no HR, there's no holiday pay, there is no maternity leave, there's no paternity leave. Like, there's no... You have to be every single member of that company, sales accounts, is it? And he was like, oh, And shit. you're not just working for yourself, you're working for everybody else. I'm working in... I'm like, they sometimes talk about in the business and on the business. Mm -hmm. And, like, you're working in the business doing the do for clients and then you also have to work on the business the business development the sales pitches all of that stuff within you know a 40 hour week which is why every self-employed person i've ever met has always ended up working more hours than they do when they work nine to five because you're having to work lots of different jobs in some way that's great i mean and i think there's negative aspects to that in terms of things like security and you know i've when I was off sick, um, I've been off sick unfortunately quite a bit this year, not sure why, but um, I don't get paid. Mm. And if I've got a job that I've booked in, that income's suddenly like gone. Mm. So it's about, you know, learning the financial skills to deal with that. I think one of the interesting things is being self-employed or like that idea of transferable skills. It does offer so many opportunities, but only if you learn how to do that so it's almost like you have to learn the skill of identifying how to transfer a skill yeah because that's really hard like you a lot of people have been trained in a very like you know fit tab a into slot b a b or whatever right so when you go well you've got tab a what slots you want to put it in everyone's like i don't fucking know so it's almost like you have to learn how to see the opportunities and learn how to transfer things, which is much more about critical thinking and strategy and stuff like that, which doesn't get taught. So it's kind of like one of the myths, I think maybe, of kind of a neoliberal capitalist approach to work is that look at all these opportunities. It's like, yeah, but you haven't taught... I don't know how to approach them because mm -hmm. I've never been taught. Mm -hmm. Because if I was taught to think strategically and critically and all that stuff, I probably wouldn't want to take part in your bloody economic system. So it's kind of like a bit of a vicious cycle I think well I think there's lots of weird things with it so you you get so if we take like a sort of white band man 1980s yeah like now a contractor like self-employed mm. and within that that this idea of uh, that very idea of working for yourself and having mm. the freedom and choosing your own hours and having this much more control over things but like you said that's not necessarily the reality but within that as well that idea of you just open a business and you're free and therefore you can do what you want it's like well that's ignoring the reality of actually running a business mm. you know like you need someone there who's doing the bureaucracy all businesses are mm. bureaucracies that paperwork needs to be done accounts need to be filed and published and you know and uh, taxes need to be done I, paperwork needs to be filed. Mm. You don't just start a business and become a billionaire and stride around mm. the earth making decorative statements. You know, you've mm. got to do the actual nitty gritty. And that's missed a lot. And I think that's a major, major problem for things like trades and small businesses, mm. like self employed people. Unless they've got an experience within a larger organisation or within a, an established company. You're not necessarily going to have those skills mm. and even if you're reading them out of the book you don't know sort of the pitfalls or the ways to improve things mm. so it's like having sure. it's like having business literacy essentially yeah, yeah, like exactly. financial literacy and things like that and a huge number of people don't have those skills and we don't really teach those skills in the schools for example like financial literacy is not something that is necessarily taught very much in a lot of schools um, but financial literacy is crucial when you work for yourself. You, I, you know, I was not very good at maths at school. I didn't really engage with it. I found it very, very difficult. And it was only when I actually ran, started my own business that I felt any affinity with, okay, I can look at these numbers because suddenly it was like applied and also suddenly it was like these numbers matter. You know, these numbers are going to make or break whether I can pay my rent or da 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 so yeah, a lot of people having that lit those literacies um, in those areas is really important to feeling capable of running a business and not getting stung. Mm -hmm. I wonder if part of it is comes from previously when we didn't have as much as a government didn't have as many rules and regulations about business setting up a business or running a business. People could just 
essentially set up a business. So I say set up a business in inverted commas. Mm. You could make money, you could bring money in and you could pay money out. Mm. And I wonder if it was, we're just still hanging on to that idea, even though the, our world and our, bureaucrat- our bureaucratic systems have changed significantly. But, the, and the, but then saying that there's a lot of people working under like, you know, let's say not illegally, but let's say sort of side <laughs> of the side of the law. And there's, you know, do, do you declare, if you're fully employed, like on a, you know, say a full-time job, and you do a bit of freelancing on the side, but you only make a couple of hundred or a couple of grand a year, do you declare it? Mm. I don't know, do you? For the like, time and the paperwork and everything else. Well, I mean, the thing is... Should you declare it? I mean, yes, legally. However, yeah, time, paperwork, all that stuff, the fact that you're going to get taxed on it above your tax threshold because of the way that you're, it all adds up. Like, people don't. And I think that's... The systems we have, you know, if we want to have, like, say, an entrepreneurial society or an ultra entrepreneurial culture, we do need to make... The running of business is easier, but that does not mean free market capitalism. But that means other things. I don't think they do want an entrepreneurial culture. I don't think they do want, you know, like you want cheap labour and the people who are at the top aren't interested in having competition. You know, it's not like they want new companies coming through to threaten their profits. They want new monopolies to start, I would say, but not necessarily new people coming through. I think I would disagree only because if I have a business, established business of 20 years and some new kid comes up with a great idea, it's a lot easier to buy that idea. Mm. Whereas if we don't have a culture in which we encourage people to set up, you know, on, be entrepreneurial, we're not going to have those people coming out and saying, oh, my idea can do something. They're not going to put a business case together. It's just going to be a kid creating something in his bedroom or whatever. Mm. So I think it's about generation of ideas and kind of harvesting them a bit um but it's there are a lot of challenges I sometimes feel quite torn in that you know in my heart and how I try and live my life is generally um not trying to not be in the throes of capitalism all the time and yet I'm a self-employed person who essentially is entrepreneurial I make a you know I I charge out at a high rate, like an hourly rate. Um, I make a good profit, and when I when I do work, um, there are things I want to do with that profit differently. But it's it's challenging for me because like I'm benefiting benefiting quite s- significantly from a, a method of working or a, a a generation of of a type of economy, while at the same time really vividly seeing all of the problems with it, particularly when I'm teaching students. And their expectations of themselves and their expectations of work. Um, it's just kind of a bit of a... There's a tension there, which I think is great. It's really helpful in a way. It helps me think about it and make better choices. Mm. But it's also kind of sometimes a bit um, difficult in discussions because I'm always flip-flopping. <laughs> well, yeah, it's like the whole sort of schizophrenic thing of you know, be, be nice and social to everyone, but also crush all the competition. Yeah, which I never... And I think that's... You, you get a bit indoctrinated in that. But ultimately, you know, there's 7 billion people on the planet. There's enough space and food and water and money for everyone. And, like, a big part, I think... A big part... For, I mean, we're kind of, like, jumping all over the place because I haven't really said what I do, but a big part of what I do and how I'm trying to think about what I do is if I continue to believe in the mythology of capitalism, of competition, then in my business, as in, well, they're my competition for, like, this client, right? If I continue to believe in that, then that is essentially agreeing with this myth of capitalism, that there isn't enough. But I don't believe that. It's this idea of scarcity. The world is not scarce. In the same way that people's time, their money, their business is not scarce. So someone can work with me or someone else and it would e- be equally as good. It would be equally as okay because there is enough for everyone. But it's really hard to kind of run a business with that kind of... I don't want... I think anti-capitalist is probably too strong and I think people would look at me and be like, you're not an anti-capitalist. But um, run a business in my, with, without trying to adhere... without getting sucked in 
mm. to that mythology and those ways of working because they're just bullshit. Mm. But it's really hard to like do, to use the use the good bits of like capitalist economy, mm. economic structures. Use the good bits or the the bits that work effectively, and discard the bad bits. It's really difficult to like try and negotiate that. But I think it's better to try. Yeah. Yeah. Than to just be like fuck it, I'm gonna be a massive capitalist because I just can't be asked. I haven't got, I have it. I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. Well, part part of it's to do with cost. It right. Well, I'll come back to sort of let let's do let's cover what you're actually doing then first. Yeah, should we do the question? Yeah. <laughs> and then I want to kind of go back to what you were saying. So, uh, if you can also talk a bit about. Um, so within your work, what do you think are the kind of destructive things that your job is doing that you can't alleviate but would like to be mm. able to alleviate? Because I would imagine with yours, I mean, most of it's probably just going to be travel and because you're not going to be, it's not like you're going and uprooting villages and displacing people and poisoning no. the water or anything. I try not to do that. <laughs> um. Okay, so I do a variety of different things and all of them are focused on helping people I helping people understand what they really care about in life and living and working according to those values. Really simply. So is it mentoring, work coaching? Yeah, so it's a huge range of stuff. So I teach, so I'm a tutor. Um, and a big part of what I do, although I teach, um, so I teach fashion branding and communication um, and fashion marketing. Although I teach under that umbrella, a lot of what I'm doing is around individual projects and what do you really care about and how can you focus on that? And a lot of what I end up doing and have always ended up doing in my university tutoring is around pastoral kind of kind of pastoral adjacent care. So as we talk about their project, it's about understanding what do you really want to do mm -hmm. with your life and what are you trying to achieve to help them feel basically that it's okay to do that. Um, I do sort of coaching and mentoring. So um, I work with people one-on-one, -on -one. often people who are creative, who perhaps struggle to really try and get the get the results they want and when I say results I don't mean financial it might be like I worked with someone recently who was doing a kickstarter for her project and a big thing for her was getting people to support it not just because they were her friends but because they genuinely cared about the project because that mm -hmm. was about what she really valued mm -hmm. um so I work with people like that or art, other artists people who want to start businesses or people who run businesses and need help essentially coming back to why they did it in the first place mm -hmm. um and when i work with larger businesses you know like limited companies it's around values-based branding so often people will have like a great logo and a nice website mm -hmm. and they won't know what the fuck they stand for mm -hmm. so it's about helping them come back to those values and feel again more connected and confident in what do i actually care about and how am i going to get there mm -hmm. because the majority of businesses and people that i work with money is not the driver mm -hmm something else is the driver but they don't necessarily know how to articulate it or mm -hmm. kind of I guess once they do articulate it they don't know how to you know how do you run a business that's focused on excitement mm -hmm. how do you run a business that's focused on like gentleness so it's working with them to work that out and then um, I do occasional workshops so I did a workshop recently for the University of Leeds around embracing change and trying to understand the kind of emotional repercussions of change um, and I talk a lot about emotion mental health um, I'm a non-violent communication practitioner mm -hmm. so I talk a bit about that so a lot of what I do is kind of with businesses or in a work capacity but it's often focused on the things that people don't want to talk about at work mm -hmm. because they think they open the office door and they forget about all of the stuff and they don't so it's talking about emotion values f you know feelings and kind of interpersonal relationships is a big thing how do we talk to each other so kind of a few different things and I occasionally sell stuff on ebay <laughs> um and i also Not got an etsy account yet though no i did but I did. <laughs> and then um 
me and my sister have this year we've run um, monthly events for creative people which are kind of a mix of personal and professional development and networking so we had one on mindfulness we had one on um getting organized so how do I sort out all the different projects that I'm doing and actually trying to structure them um and again that's about connecting people to what they really care about especially for creative people so many creative people reject the idea that they're allowed to be creative mm-hmm. like subconsciously um so it's about helping them return to that so this is why I think you know when I'm explaining it, one of the challenges I have there isn't a job title for this there is just the things that I do that come under this heading of helping people know I guess who they are and what they care about and helping them mm deliver on that in their life and like not ignore it i wish there was a job title it would be helpful i might make one up so yeah that's what i I mean consultants generally it's consultant and it's kind of like is it i don't know is it a lot one of the things i think is quite interesting having this discussion now is um i'm just about to embark on a big year-long coaching program for myself Mm -hmm. partly because i'm finding that I really want to do something more expansive and wide reaching with this work, but I don't know how to because I'm kind of coming up to a block about how to communicate it, about how to get the message out there. Things like running a business, I'm going to need some support and help. Like, who do I need to work with? So it's quite interesting having this conversation now and I guess articulating a bit of that um, experience and I guess sharing with people that it's not as easy as like, you know, when I started my freelance business, I was a copywriter because mm. that's what I, I did at my, when I worked in marketing agencies. I was a copywriter and that was it. You know, it's just simple. Everyone gets it. Apart from one guy, <laughs> once I said I'm a copywriter and he said, oh, so patents and stuff. And I was like, like he thought I was a, did, anyway. I was like, okay, yeah, I work in the patents office. I'm like <laughs> Einstein. <laughs> but... <laughs> Um, everyone kind of vaguely gets that or at least part of the name whereas when you go so what do you do now I'm like well you know all those things that you really care about in your life that you don't want to tell anyone but you wish were part of your life every day I help you do that you know that's quite I don't know what that is but that's you know anyway so it's an interesting discussion to have now Mm -hmm. so that's kind of what I do so how long how long have you been doing this would you say as as because I would imagine there's some evolution to it where you're picking up sort of piecemeal work before you kind of formulate yeah. into it. Right, this is this is my raison d'etre. Mm. Um, so how how long would you say you've been doing this as is? Like, or how long would you say you could call yourself? You would see yourself as being professional in this field. I've been self-employed in March. March twenty twenty will be five years. In terms of this work that I'm doing now. I think it's probably in the last year that I've really felt this is the direction. And previously to that, in all of my jobs, um, in all of my, like my full-time jobs, Mm. in all of my self-employment work, there has been some element (coughs) of it. (coughs) You okay? Um, There has been some element of that. So I started kind of guest lecturing, for example, when I was still working Mm full-time. Um, I started doing things like mentoring or just some sort of like supporting people. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I guess when I was um, when I was eighteen at university, I started doing private tutoring and working with kids. But a lot of sometimes what I was doing was things like supporting them through the eleven plus or mm-hmm. through A levels and just trying to help them feel confident. Mm-hmm. So it's always been something that I've just done, but it's only in the last year that I would say. I've gone, oh, yeah, this is... A th- it's like I've always done it, but I just decided to tell people about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm kind of a beginner. So it's kind of like you... Would it be fair to say that you kind of started taking your own advice? from Because, you know, you're telling people to sort of self actualize be themselves and mm. work at what they want to do. And then if you've only just kind of sort of solidified that in the last year, then to me it sounds a little bit like you were kind of on your own evolution to that point? Yeah. Is that not right? No. In some ways, yeah. I think we're all on that. Like, so everyone in their life's journey is on a process of of that, if you want to call it self-actualization or like realizing um, what they really care about. 
everyone does it, but some people do it on their deathbed. Mm. Some people do it when they're 10. Mm. Uh, I think for me, there was a lot of processes that I had to go through before I got to that point mm. because it's really hard to be comfortable with what you really care about and want to do in the world if, for example, you have low self-esteem or you are a, like a survivor of trauma because there's so many holes that you feel like, well, I can't... Like we were talking about before about operating from this place of like feeling scarcity or feeling like the... You know, in the kind of hippie community, it's like abundance. Mm. But actually, it is abundance. Mm. It's feeling like you are coming from a place of just complete wholeness. I wasn't there. I had a lot of like emotional difficulties, a lot of like trauma recovery to do. And it, I wouldn't have been able to get to this point without that. So it's not necessarily that I think I took my own advice professionally. It's that when I had done all the steps to help myself personally, emotionally, and kind of in my like heart and my soul, it was like, oh shit, this is the thing I've been doing all along. Mm. I've been helping others. There was a big shift actually. Like it's quite an emotional topic for me because it is something I care about so much. Mm -hmm. But there was a shift when what when people said they really liked what I did or they said, oh, you really helped me, I would like burst into tears. Mm. So if a student emailed me when they were leaving and be like, oh, you know, I really appreciate your help and you really, you know, made a difference, I would just like cry. Mm -hmm. And there was a point where I stopped crying and it was because I recognised that I was allowed to like get that feedback and I was allowed to kind of be loved and cared for and for what, that what I did was meaningful. Mm. That was the point when I went, oh, okay, now I can talk about this. Now I can do this openly. Now I can come from this good place rather than coming from a place of just feeling like I wasn't allowed. Like, you know, if you're really fucked up, which is what I thought I was, why are you allowed to talk to anyone about, like, feeling great about yourself? Because everyone is. Yeah. <laughs> but that's really hard to know when you're, like, in the pit. Yeah. So in terms of, yeah, I think I did take some of my own advice but probably not in the same way I think that I I kind it was more like it had just been for all of the people I work with actually and this is I guess the same for me it's always been there mm. just everything else gets in the fucking way mm. so I had to kind of get like work on all that stuff first and a lot of the people I do work with have done that bit so they've done, they've been to therapy, they've done some healing, they've done some kind of trauma work or they're, they've dealt with their mental health challenges. They kind of know that they can take care of themselves personally. Mm -hmm. And then they go, oh, well, this, why is my work not, why have I not done that with my work? And that's where I kind of start working with them. Mm -hmm. Does that answer the question? No, it does, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I do want to go back to this point. So like in terms of, detrimental impact like I don't know it's not like I'm just trying to concentrate on the negative because yeah. like just from your own description there there's a straightforward positive impact of like you know you're positively impacting people's lives yes which is going to give an overall positive um an amount of like like me in, yeah my, my index is so, going yeah out. yeah so on the destructive side yeah of just we live in the world the world as mm. it is now in a first world country, basically the second, well, every time we breathe, we're destroying rainforests <laughs> and like just by being alive. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, what, what are the kind of downsides and uh, is there any ability for you to negate that? Because you already know that you're, you're adding a, a, a sort of net positive gain. You would say, because yes. those people are going to go on and they're going to add positive gain. Um, there's going to be embedded negativity in it, but would you say that there is anything that you could do that you need to change, or is it just from a like material sustainability perspective? Let's say first of all, um, I don't drive, so I in terms of like stuff like transport, get the bus, which is always like there's this weird thing I think sometimes with the world, a lot of business and work things are not built around environmental sustainability mm -hmm. they're built around like speed and pace so when, when people are like can you come and do a workshop and I'm like yeah is there a bus stop nearby it kind of has this weird um 
slightly unprofessional quality mm -hmm. but when I explain you know this these are my choices that I'm making so I do things like that I think probably a big material thing that I do is a lot of the stuff I do people think through issues and feelings more effectively when they do it on paper mm -hmm. and so I go through a lot of paper mm -hmm. and I do personally as well because I'm a big writer and journaler that is something that I feel is quite I'm aware of it mm -hmm. but I also know it it isn't as effective if you do it digitally. Yeah. I don't know what the kind of solution there is apart from continuing to recycle and buying recycled paper and just... Well, I don't know that there's an overall, like, you know, paperless stuff. I mean, you're using your rare earths and your cobalt and, you know, all mm. of the millions of deaths that are attached to those for, for using electronic and computer software. Is that, That's true. Is that better than you know and running it off electricity so you've got to burn fossil fuel mm. to it so you, you're literally contributing carbon to the atmosphere as you're doing whatever creative creative thing mm. or work thing that you're doing on an electronic device when I mean, you've got a piece of paper you're writing both sides of it with a pen it's like, yeah. is it really more damaging and people keep it i think there's a longevity to writing on paper and there has it has a such a strong like you know, it's, it's, a, it's a strong bond. It's, it's, it's huge And I would bond. say it's still an immensely powerful technology. And I would say it's probably a more, like for me personally, I think it's a more powerful technology than, than the internet and everything else. Yeah. It's reliable. It's always there. You don't yeah. have to wait for it to load. As yeah. long as you don't lose it. It's more effect and it's more effective to achieve the things that my I want to achieve with the people I work with. Mm. And they want to achieve. So that's the thing. Something that I have recognised that I do, but I probably would never have like couched it in the language of, of like detrimental effect, is I, you know, if someone comes approaches me to work with me, I'd normally go on a kind of intuitive level of like, do I want to work with them or not? And there have been people that I've turned down, and I recognise now that partly the reason I turn them down is because of some sort of, I feel there's some sort of detrimental thing going on. So... That doesn't have to be like, oh, they make, I don't know, guns. Yeah. I don't want to work with them. It's not as simple as that. And like I've worked for, you know, when I was working full time, I was working for like, you know, massive financial companies, some of whom were directly responsible for the 2008, you know, banking crisis. I was working with gambling firms. We even had some like not, you know, I don't think pornography is bad. I think there's some fucking bad pornography, though. We're working with people like that. We're working with pet food companies. You know, like, there are worse. Yeah. That I'm, you know, I'm working with artists who, like... But, so, for example, someone came to me and said, oh, can we work with, together? This was a few years ago now. And I said, you know, what's your goal? What do you want to achieve in a year? And they said, I want to make a million pounds. And I went... I don't want to work with you. Mm. And at the time, it was just like, this is a bad feeling. But I think what I recognise now is... I well, feel... you also can't deliver that either. It's like, you're not going to be... Okay, here's my 12-point step so yeah. you get a million pounds within a year. Yeah. And also, like, it's just... Well, all the big research groups, like um, Mintel and McKinsey, everyone has been talking about for years, and Harvard Business Group for years, has been the importance of values and the importance of a meaningful reason for, to have a business. And that's why people buy things. or but, So people buy because of necessity, but when it's o like over the kind of the necessity level, the choice is around, do I care about this and do I feel affinity with it? If... This guy was making products for kids. Like saying, oh, well, what's your goal? Oh, well, I want to make a million pounds. No fucking parents aren't going to want to like, isn't going to want to contribute to that. Yeah. Whereas if you said, I want to bring joy into the hearts of millions of children, everyone wants to contribute to that. No one wants to not contribute to that. So it's like, I you think... You would have been better off saying, I want to make a million children happy. Yeah. <laughs> and I would have been like, that's really nice. Okay, I don't think you're going to achieve that in a year. That's a big goal. However, I think you could definitely achieve that in a certain amount of time. But... I think it's like I've got some because part of what I do is like being in tune with my own values and what I want the world to be like. I think I've got some sort of intuitive process where I go, you are not working in the way that I think the world should be. And I want the world to be more sustainable and more to not have detrimental effects. So there's some choices I'm making, perhaps unknowingly, where I'm going, I don't this isn't right mm -hmm. for me. Um, so I tend not to work, I wouldn't ever say to a bit, like I wouldn't ever say I don't work with businesses who do X, Y, Z because 
you're for me that's cutting myself off from actually p- possibly improving a business mm-hmm. um and also you don't know that well like you say improving the business but you you don't know necessarily that you do dislike the thing like yeah if you find out more about it it might be more nuanced than exactly. you might initially assume yeah i can't tell until yeah. i've met them and i've read about them and i've like had some sort of Actual interaction with them. Yeah. yeah and so i tend to to end up working with people who are kind of on the same wavelength, uh, which I think a lot of um, like um, individuals do running businesses like this is, is you just, those people are drawn to you and you are drawn to them. So I think that's part of it in terms of what are the detrimental effects. I have some issues around teaching fashion and fashion marketing because fashion is, the second biggest you know it's the second biggest polluter in the world is an industry only behind oil it's incredibly wasteful um it's just ultimately very depressing and the idea of like it being sustainable there being a movement towards sustainable purchasing is essentially a fallacy people are doing it but not not to any extent that we think they are as long as you've got advertising, you're just not going to get rid of right? consumerism. It says straightforward, non-stop, propaganda barrage of like consume, consume, consume. So that's a big thing is the fact like, you know, I've kind of, one of those things that I do understand marketing. I get it. Like I get what to do. Because I think the best marketing comes from empathy and comes from like understanding the person you're talking to and facilitating whatever it is that they want to achieve in their life or providing them with something that says that they achieve the thing. Rapport building is the thing. Yeah. So I get it. So it's just unfortunate that I'm kind of good at something or I understand something which I also recognise to be hugely problematic. Mm. Um, So in the work that I do with students, often what I'm doing or or really getting them to think about is the kind of ethical and moral quandaries that come up with some of the work that they may be required to do Mm -hmm. and how they can negotiate and navigate that. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean telling them all they shouldn't work for fashion brands. Mm -hmm. It's getting them to think about, I guess, make some choices, be conscious of your choices. Um, and be be conscious that if you are asked to do something and it goes against again what you value and what you believe to be important in your life, mm-hmm. how are you going to negotiate that? How are you going to deal with that? Mm-hmm. But that is that can be difficult sometimes. Are you familiar with the Alan MacArthur Foundation? I know of it, but I don't know a huge amount of stuff about no, it. Circular economy mm-hmm. stuff. Be, yeah, yeah. So I mean that that would be. I, I saw a tweet yesterday that was from them that was basically that was like three industries. One of them was aluminium, there were two others. And it was like, if we just have made these three industries mm-hmm. a circular economy system, um, it would wipe out as much carbon as is generated by all the traffic in the mm-hmm. world. Which is just like, you it's know, there, there's so many straightforward, easy wins that are just like a tiny bit of legislation. Mm-hmm. And it wouldn't, it's like, but because we live in such a, an ideological society, like, that pretends, you know, in the Gizé way of like, we're not ideological at all, we are not ideology, and it's the most ideological. So much is just off the table, it's just, mm. you can't do it because communism, whatever, or it threatens somebody's profits, mm. and it, it's ridiculous. It's mm. ridiculous that we can't have a more mixed economy, that we can't live in a sensible way. Mm. I just find it very odd. Yeah, it's, I think it's... Um... You know, you know, general election coming up. Unless this, if this is released afterwards, we can do like we can do some different cuts of us like cheering or crying, depending <laughs> on the result. Um, in terms of like government or legislation, I'm always going to vote for um, policies which I believe are kind of for the good of the many, not the few. Mm. But one of the challenges I think is that most of us feel that it's hard to. To like to create that on an individual level yeah. and if you know or you reading about sustainability it gets to the point where you realize i think it was george mumbia who said like don't take long haul flights and become vegetarian everything else is basically just like who fucking cares mm-hmm. until we legislate mm-hmm. on big companies so one of the biggest things that i try to do in my work is i do genuinely believe i really believe this if we have more people listening to 
their internal values Mm -hmm. to what they really care about they will be seeking less satisfaction externally Mm -hmm. and they will be less inclined to play by these arbitrary rules and these ideologies which aren't fulfilling them Mm -hmm. so a lot of what i'm trying to do is saying to people don't think that you have to have this special fancy job. Don't think that you have to earn all this money. Mm. Don't think you have to buy a fucking Audi and da 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 da. What if you really care about adventure? That is something that is so crucial to who you are and your soul. Just do that. Mm. Don't worry about anything else. So a big part of me is like it feels really small, but like you said about that having that positive, that kind of net positive ripple effect. If I can get one student to make a choice between, okay, I'm going to take a job actually that is more in alignment with who I am and less about ticking this fancy capitalist box, Mm -hmm. that's an achievement. That, to me, is working towards that kind of greater sustainable project. Mm -hmm. A a big part of... Well, not a big part, but, like, I did a a chunk of research around human sustainability and how we can develop that in university education. Mm -hmm. So there's the kind of... From the Brunton report, there's economic, social, environmental, and then there's human. Mm -hmm. But people kind of don't talk about human a lot Mm -hmm. because it's about... They talk about human capital, which I feel a bit like, uh, about... Or human resources. Human resources. But in terms of capital, it's about what do I know? What skills do I have? My level of education? What do I have internally? My resources, which can help me essentially go through life in a sustainable manner. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that people don't often talk about human sustainability is because it's got like a really, really long, really long term um, like ROI. Yes. Because you educate a child at five, you're not going to see the results of that till 20 years later. So it's kind of on the same. It's got some of the similar problems in a way as environmental sustainability and that p- people can't conceive of the, the time frame in which we need to be operating. Mm-hmm. But for me, that's where I kind of. I feel like there's a real opportunity to create more sustainable societies by working in that area of sustainable development Mm -hmm. is how can we educate people and equip people so they have internal resources that help them develop and progress through life. Mm -hmm. Because the more internal resources you have and the more resilience, power, the feeling that you are okay, Mm -hmm. the less you will be looking externally to be made okay, which means less, for me, it means less consumerism, less materialism, less focus on like social approval. Mm-hmm. It's more about, do you know what? I'm all right. Mm-hmm. And not I'm all right, conservatism with a small c, isolationism. It's I'm all right and therefore I have the opportunity to help others and to become part of this wider group. Mm-hmm. So there's kind of like a bit of a left field approach that I, I like taking because it's also something I think every single person can do. Mm. Every single person. Some people can't be vegetarian because they've got anemia or whatever, right? Mm. But every single person can go, right, I'm going to equip myself and do the work that I need to do to feel okay with who I am. Mm. So I stop looking externally for these validations. Mm. That doesn't mean you don't buy clothes. It doesn't mean you don't buy nice face products or mm. don't go on holiday. It means that you do so consciously and that you do so not because you feel like you have to or not because you feel it's going to fill a gap in who you are. Mm. I'm one of those terrible lefty university types. Well, I was going to say, so how does that... <coughs> you know, it, it, it's good and it's all, you know, it's nice verbiage. And I agree largely, you know, I'm sort of sympathetic with all that. How, how at, at the more difficult end, you know, like how we like to label people these days as vulnerable or whatever. Yeah. Like, uh, does that apply for someone who's from a poor background equally as much? Because they're not necessarily going to have the resources to be like, right, I'm totally going to get my head together and now I'm going to do the thing that I want to do. Mm. I mean, they might not even be in an art field in the first mm. place because it's like, that's too mm. bougie for me. I need to go and smash bush stops or whatever. So I like, I sometimes think about this myself as well because, you know, the majority of people I've worked with tend to be middle class. <clears throat> a lot of my students, the fact that they're at university gives them a certain level of privilege. I predominantly um, work with white people, mm. and white cis women. Just that is what happens. Mm. I think one of the challenges is that 
this is probably why for me I'm um, I do I want things to change on a systemic level as in governmental reform mm -hmm. because it means that everyone is given something is given a kind of you know like for example there should be a social baseline social baseline if you've got a social baseline then everyone can start working on these things at the moment it's like stop if it, I think someone says you know when you when you're worrying about where your next meal is coming from no one's kind of pondering the nature of existence yeah, yeah. So at the moment, because there's not a social baseline, there's a huge number of people who aren't feeling capable of kind of looking within and going, what do I need to do? And how do, like, as I said, creating that, those resources for themselves or recognising they have those resources. Well, if you can't get out of bed, you're not going to go and yeah. self-actualise it. Do I think that everyone has the capability to develop those resources? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do I think I can help everyone develop those resources by myself? No. I think there needs to be significant systemic like reform mm -hmm. again for that social baseline. But also then there's the opportunity of going and kind of, I suppose, having better access to people and processes which help develop those resources. So, for example, therapy on the NHS. Mm -hmm. Predominantly the therapy that's provided on the NHS is cognitive behavioural therapy which is great it's not talking therapy it's not not psychoanalysis psychoanalysis however and talking therapy helps you get to like deep root problems which you kind of have to deal with that shit before you can change your behavior so there's a weird like issue there so that's things like that in terms of i have a couple of people who i work with who often have um they're kind of chronic pain sufferers or maybe they have particularly difficult mental health challenges one of the things around that is helping them develop methods to do the thing they want to do mm -hmm. while also caring for themselves. Mm -hmm. So that again, that's I think part of it is just giving people time and not I try not to get sucked into that myth of like, well, if you have this, you're basically you can't do any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Which I think we accidentally can end up doing. We can say, Oh well if someone if someone is poor or if someone is suffering with depression or if someone is doing that suddenly they can't do any of that stuff it's like actually they might be able to do some of those things in a very specific way that works for them that's actually going to be beneficial but it takes time and like interaction to get to that point where they know what those are and we're not like I think that's the thing that's lacking is maybe that that individual okay how can I do this because otherwise people you know so you're having a really shitty time with anxiety and everyone's like, you need to do self-care. And it's like every moment that you spend with yourself is like a fucking hurricane mm -hmm. and it's really stressful. I'm not doing enough self-care. I'm not doing Why enough do self-care. I'm, yeah, so I'm doing it wrong <laughs> and like everything I do, oh, I can't go to the shop to buy a bath bomb because I'm too freaky. Out. You know, Lush is like this. I smell too much to go <laughs> yeah. and smell good. <laughs> yeah, Lush is like this huge, like hypersensitive situation, <laughs> right? And it's a very intense smell when you get It's the like, I know people who can't go in. So... And then they go, well, I, well, that means that I can't do it, therefore I'm a failure. Mm -hmm. And we're not, for me, it's about providing a greater scope of what you can do mm -hmm. around that. So actually, is it self-care actually for that person is more about breathing techniques or it's more about being in nature or it's more about, I don't know, just sitting quietly or putting on a nice outfit, which sounds so minor. Or even saying to them, it's okay to watch three hours of TV. Yeah. <laughs> and it's kind of, we do that online, you know, Instagram has this great kind of fantastic like number of inspirational motivational quotes mm -hmm. and it means fuck all mm -hmm. because you need someone to sit with you and look you in the eyes and tell you it. Mm -hmm. You don't need to read it online. You need someone to sit with you as an individual and hear you. Mm -hmm. So I don't have, at the moment, I would like to work with more people from more diverse backgrounds to help them do the things that they want to do. Mm. At the moment, I don't know how to do that. And something that I want to do is, is, is work out how. Mm -hmm. Because I think that, I don't think that what I'm doing is just, you know, the methods that only white women can use. Mm -hmm. However, I think there's something about, there are different methods for different people at all different times. Um, are you familiar with the uh, email newsletter doing good leads? No, but I will write it down. Yeah, get on them. 
because they're, they're quite good for linking you to other things and you might want to be advertising yourself on there. Yeah, and like I'd like something that I would like to do, it's not, I think one of the challenges of being self-employed is you kind of take this hit where if you haven't got a lot of work on, mm. you can't offer a lot of stuff for free. Mm. And you get into this weird, like, glitchy situation where, like, everyone has to make sure they're not, you know, fix the holes in the boat first. Mm. So something that I found this year is I haven't been able to do that as much because I haven't necessarily had the financial resources that I wanted. However, as I was saying to you earlier before we started recording, I'm really interested in setting up some sort of pot of money Mm. to help so that either, you know, I can go out and deliver stuff for free or people can access some support or they can... I'm really interested in doing, like, a free ticket to every workshop that I do. But it's it's kind of like working out how to do that in a way that's compassionate and not about charity mm-hmm. and that is accessing the right people and all those sorts of, like, complicated type things, mm-hmm. which <clears throat> I think are... It's a whole other, like, job. Yeah. And that's something, yeah, definitely that I I want to begin to do and I want to learn how to do it because I don't just want to work with the same people all the time. And I don't. I see the people I work with and I'm like, they are diverse, in particularly they're neurodiverse. Mm-hmm. Um, but probably people would look at my client list and be like, oh, right, okay, you're one of them, are you? And I don't want to be one of them, you know? And it, it, it it's a challenge. It's a challenge with some of those things. And I think it's, uh, I would like to to change that. And that's maybe an, a next step for me. Do you ever feel that, uh, do you ever get that thing, you know, a lot of people who are self-employed, are sort of, they, they get themselves into that trap of they can't, they feel like they can't refuse work because it's like, I've always, I don't know, you know, because it's not, it's not guaranteed, you know, you're not on a salary, it's like you don't work, you don't get paid, so every bit of work that comes along, it's like, I've got to get it, I've got to nail it down. It doesn't seem like you really suffer from that. No. Uh, but that's about, you know, when I um, was working full-time, when I got, like, a pay rise in my very, very last job, um, I started saving, and then when I became self-employed, a lot of people who are self-employed don't save because... Um, as a society, we're not very good at saving mm. because we don't, because we have short termism, mm. because of capitalism. <laughs> it's like that's always, but I have always been brought up to be very like to think long term. So both of my parents are very, very kind of strategic, mm. like almost logical people. As a child, not great. As an adult, really helpful. Mm. So I've always kind of seen, seen things in a much more long term view. So I started saving. I went, um, self-employed when I was 28 I joined a pension scheme um at 28 and I like a private one and I save into that I also save my own like little pension money but I started saving and I saved more than I needed to for tax so a lot of people don't save enough for tax because um they just assume that it will be fine so because of that I built up quite a big pot of money of savings that had various emotional attachments which I then really struggled with because it was like I'm not allowed that money blah de blah blah all that shit but because of that I never felt like oh I have to do this work Mm -hmm. it's like there is some savings there I never ended up really having to to look at take those savings but over the last year I have I have used that because I chose to you know go traveling Mm -hmm. and chose to maybe do work which is less regular or less volume so like when I used to do copywriting jobs I'd regularly get copywriting jobs that were like four grand you know for huge swathes of content you don't really get that with the people I'm working with so like coaching I try and do flat fee at the moment because so many people charge a huge amount of money for it and I want it to be accessible but I also want to make sure that I'm yeah you don't want to underprice yourself because then you've seen cheaper yeah what you're offering seems of less value yeah and it's not it's really effective but it's also about like the with things like coaching and mentoring they're energetically really demanding just like care work it's care work is so energetically demanding and we do not pay people enough to do that work teaching all of those sorts of things where it's like a service and coaching and mentoring has a similar like it's in no way as energetically demanding as those things but it has a similar energy like 
cost. So I need to make sure that I'm going, right, well, I'll charge this much because then I know, actually, I can't do any other work for that day. Mm. But I try, and, I try and charge that, but I've never really had that thing of, like, saying no is a problem. And I also have, apparently, I was known for a while as, like, the one who doesn't do mates rates. And I think it's because... But that's good. That, that really means good. that you're like, well, no, I'm not going to... Th- this is my price. This is, this the is what I'm yeah. offering is what it's worth. And people like... Um, an old colleague of mine was doing some freelance work for an organisation we both used to work for. And I said, oh, they never hire me. Mm. And he said, oh, it's because I heard them. They, they think you're really... They're like, oh, sh- you're always busy and you're, like, expensive. But not in a, like you're too expensive, mm. just in a way of like, oh, you're, you're so, it's like a luxury handbag. Mm. Yeah. And I thought, well, all right, yeah, fine, I'll take that. But it's like too many self-employed people start by undercharging. Mm. Like you can always lower your prices. Mm. But also people don't, they, they offer the price. Mm. Like one of the best bits of advice I got, I think my first freelance job was, if you tell them the price and they don't blink, mm. you're not charging enough. Mm. So, like, they offer the price as this, like, am I allowed to ask for 20 quid an hour? Mm. It's like, you can fucking ask for whatever you want. Mm. So I've never really had a, an issue with, like, I probably didn't charge as much as I could have done, and I've recently put my prices up for some things. But that's like, like you know, as you progress through your career, you get paid more, hopefully. So as I progress through my freelance, I get paid more. Mm. But I've never really had a problem with saying no, because... It's not, it's not worth it. Mm. And like, it's not like I've got loads and loads of cash. I think I'm in a better financial situation than a lot of my peers because of the way that I've chosen to live my life mm. and the things that I don't have and the way that I, my, my mind operates in terms of strategic, like, save for the future things. Um, but I just also think if you say yes to a job that doesn't feel right like you regret it like as you are saying yes Mm. and then you just resent it Mm. and then it takes you like three times as long to do the work so it's not cost effective and it's just there will be other jobs there are always other jobs there are um but you know they're not necessarily going to be better ones no, I guess it depends. Like I'm quite I'm one of those terribly optimistic people. Well, I do, I, I, I do want to go back to your earlier point because I do think that's very interesting in terms of... So, me not working at the moment, um, like, it's been fantastic. Mm-hmm. Like I was saying to you earlier, you know, we're in the middle of winter and, like, last year when I was working, getting up in the darkness, coming home in the darkness, and it's cold, and it's just kind of... A really horrible time of year especially coming up to Christmas because everyone's starting to get more and more crazy and, <laughs> yeah you know until you actually have Christmas where you have that brief moment of oh we'll all just sit down for five <laughs> minutes now yeah and then and then you have the new year and then it's back to misery with the Monday of the year and it's just really nice but the thing is it makes a massive difference of having some resources so mm. I got some tax back from earlier in the year which gave me enough cash to kind of not have to bother working but as I'm running out of that cash I'm now getting back to the position of well there is stuff that I kind of have to pay for I mean Mm. I kind of can get away with as well not paying for it but I want to pay for it to a degree um and that's going to force me into a position where it's like I just have to take a job and I just have to take a job whatever comes along the Mm. first thing that comes along which I know I'll hate and which will be beneath me, which will be like, you know, and I'll stay there and I'll be really miserable for however long and then I'll come out and then I'll, I'll, I'll have to go and do that again. Mm. Um, but you only feel that, you're only in that position when you're, when you're out of cash. Mm. Uh, um, and as well, uh, I remember this, reading this article a few years back talking about, you know, all this sort of bans and things in the 20th century that came out of working class culture is like well a lot of that was enabled by the fact that mm-hmm. you had benefits you know you could survive without you know working some zero hours contracts yeah or like in the 90s there was a huge fashion explosion in fashion brands mm. like amazing kind of fashion brands set up in london and that was because of government 
um, creative industry, like injection of money and mm. funds and grants. If you haven't got the space to think or to breathe, you, you, you haven't got the space to create. No. I think it's, it, it's quite challenging in that a lot of... How do I say this? A lot of people um, are... I'm a really optimistic person. Like, I just am. I think I've had to be for a lot of reasons in my life because otherwise I would probably just fucking kill myself by now, honestly. So, for me, like, students have asked me, oh, do I have to work a shitty job after uni just to do this, that and the other? And I I'm always say, I wish I could tell you no. But You don't have to, but you don't you're have very to. likely to. You're very to. likely to. But one of the things that happens is that what we get this short-termism, we get it. We go, oh, right, I've not got enough money right now, so I need to take a job that I'm going to... I'm doing lots of inverted commas. I need, in inverted commas, to take a job that I know I'm going to hate. It's going to force me, is what your words were, I'm going to force me to take this job, etc., etc. And what happens is we get this myopic thing of, like, well, I'm going to do this job. If you're in any way inclined to, like... Um, as I definitely am mental health kind of malaise and depression, you go, well, this is it, this is it for the rest of my life. I'm never going to get a better job. Da, 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 da. And you kind of get into this spiral of like, this is it. And I have to do these shitty jobs. Mm. I genuinely think that if all of us had a bit of kind of understanding of, right, what do I really care about? And what is my long-term situation? And I'm talking like 20 years at least, mm. if not 50 we would go, do you know what? I am going to take this job for six months and I'm, I'm not going to enjoy it. But what I'm going to do is at the end of every day, I'm going to make sure that I do this, this and this. I'm going to make sure that I do this in my job. I'm going to top up my money. I'm going to, whatever it is that you need to do to get to the point where you feel like I don't think this is a complete fucking waste of my time. Because mm. there are a lot of, I did some shit shop jobs, but they, looking back, I actually really enjoyed them at the time, often, not always, but often because I was learning loads of stuff, I love learning, or I was getting to interact with customers, and some of them I hated, and some of them I was like, I'm really finding this useful to learn how to talk to people. Mm. Um, and then when I was working full time, again, some terrible clients, some terrible colleagues, but I was like, I am learning so much right now, and I'm getting the money, the money's coming in, and it's not like a huge amount, it's not a bad amount, but it's just the money is coming in and I'm saving it and I know that this is not going to do... I'm not going to be doing this forever, but I'm doing it now. But because I think we don't have that, like, 20-year, 50-year... Not even, like, plan in, like, this really structured way, but even a kind of vision of who, we, like, our life, we think that whatever is happening right now is it. Yeah. And it's actually, like... Yeah, you probably... A, maybe you're at a point now where you're like, OK, so I need to take on a job. I think but I'm, you you maybe one of the reasons you're so happy now is because you're doing stuff that you really fucking care about and if there's an opportunity to say right if i really care I about think this it's more i'm not doing stuff that i really don't care about than doing stuff that i really do care so about. Opera- i think that's a, 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 a more important thing to me it's more important to me to not be wasting my time on some mindless rubbish, which is generally what society wants us to do. Yeah. Um, and that's been my experience through most of it. It's like, come and do this mindless thing that makes someone who's already rich, richer, mm-hmm. and adds nothing to your life. So if that's <laughs> coming from, I th- I, so many people feel like that. I felt like that. That's one of the reasons I left full time work. Yeah, and I'm much happier not doing. Yeah, it. so you're so that's your minus one is like working for someone else, generating all the cash for them, doing mindless shit. So you're right now you're at zero, which is I'm not doing that. Mm. But we spend so much of our time trying to not be at minus one and just be at zero that we're just all right. Mm. Whereas if the next step is to go, so what would make it plus one? And to do one thing to get there. So the next time that you're going to go in and be like, right, I want to, I do want to get a job or I want to get a temporary job. I want to do something for six months. What is it that I can do? Or what is it that I can learn about? Or what is the thing that's important to me? And then I choose it based on that. Because a lot of people are much more educated and skilled and motivated than they currently think they are because they've been led to believe that they're not good enough by systemic issues by individuals by families by teachers but actually you know you're an incredibly intelligent articulate person who really cares about work who's like clearly is 
really well versed in a huge number of things can talk to people the idea that you are going to be forced into a shitty job i just think okay no but that's me again this is the why i'm doing the things that i'm doing because i really look at i look at people and i just think there is so much there to be explored and expressed and yes sometimes i've taken on freelance jobs that i've said yes to that i haven't found that interesting but i've said yes because i'm like that's that money in the bank or that's that freedom or that's that time it's buying me or whatever mm. doesn't mean just because i said yes to everything doesn't mean i've said yes like orgasm yes mm. it's just yes okay i need that or i need this or whatever but i don't think we do that we don't have this like vision of what we'd think our life could be like mm. and i'm not you know i think when people talk about that it's like not being a, you don't it's not about being a millionaire or like having a fancy house it's about i would get to the point where i'm like 40 or 50 or 60 mm. and just be like do you know what yeah i did spend loads of time writing that book or i did spend loads of time with my friend or cultivating a vegetable garden or like trap whatever the fuck it is mm. when we do that everything we do now feels like less of a bind mm. And I know, like, yeah, it is a lot of words. And I think that sometimes it's hard because I think, is anyone fucking listening to me? But when pe- when I work with people to do this and really go into the nitty gritty and they say, well, I can't do that. My a, a client I worked with recently, her goal was to go to New York on an independent trip just for like four days. Which seems like, oh, surely you could just book a plane. Right, you're like frowning, like, what? But that is about her identity as not attached to her family. She wanted to make the money for that trip funded from her own business, not her part-time job. Mm -hmm. She wanted to go there as an individual, experience it in her way, do all that stuff. It was not about... She wanted something of her own. And that is everything that we're doing in our life is something of our own, something that is truly who we are. Mm. And... The biggest thing for her was going through that process of being like, this is not about a holiday. This is about who you are and who you want to express and feeling okay with that. It's not just about a job. You you said there about it being below you because that's recognising your own self-worth. The fact you can do that, a huge number of people can't do that. So recognising your own self-worth and that you have skills and something to offer and being okay with wanting better, that's quite hard for a lot of people. Well, I think it's especially hard for the English because it's so like, well. But you're so you know you're so deserving. You don't deserve it, and you're not going to get yeah. it. So shut up. And that's like <laughs> remember and to that, tip your cap. And that voice and that head movement you just did, which is a kind of like slightly looking down. You know, that's the voice of so many parents, so many teachers. It's the voice of the country, mm. and it's that's just what this country tells people. And it's just not true. Because what most people want is not this kind of extraordinary, you know, most people don't want power and money and no, like they land just want to be treated like a person. They want to be respected and they don't want to be looked down upon when they just meet someone of like, you know, you don't want to be looked up and down and then someone's dismissing you out of hand because you got the wrong clothes on or yeah. and what happens? combed the wrong way. What happens is we look in the mirror and we don't respect ourselves. We dismiss ourselves. Mm-hmm. We say, you know, there's, it's like people who've got these amazing hobbies that they don't tell anyone about or like these fantastic accomplishments that they have achieved or these and I've done it before I just won't I did I was a keynote speaker for a conference I didn't fucking tell anyone it's not like I'm perfect I'm just like got all my shit sorted it's that it's a continual journey of recognizing that we have worth and value and that we are allowed to want our lives to reflect that and we're allowed to want our jobs and the work that we do to reflect that if that is your choice. You don't have to. No, no, no. Well, again, I think it's an interesting point. But isn't that about... Uh, uh, I need to start reading more because my language acquisition skills are pretty terrible at the moment. Um, it, it, isn't that about setting the person though as well it's not just about training them in you know a bunch of mantras or um, <coughs> kind of affirmations of like no I am really worth it and I can go out and win And but like they need to be embedded within a context 
of that, of people going, no, you are worth it. And I think that's... Yeah, that's why people but work... that's the hard thing to build. That's surely, why people you can work build it with within mentors. an individual, but then the individual then has to build that network out. Like, mm-hmm. Our that's society why... very definitely does not contribute, it does not create an environment for that. Even if you're in a, a loving, supportive family, like you're going to go into friendship groups. So like, I can't, I definitely can't imagine or see being in, in some kind of friendship group where everyone's like supporting you, for want of a better word. Especially, you know, being in Northern England where it's more like, if you want to do something, your mates are more likely to knock you, like banter, but they're more likely to knock you than support you. So well, someone, I used to be in a friendship group when I was at uni and someone once said to me, you should be really careful about, you know, telling people about all the stuff you're doing because it makes them feel really bad. So what yeah, do I do? Well, that's Just that not per- your fault. So the key is there, though, that you are the change. Like, yeah, I agree. We don't necessarily have those contexts at the moment. This is why people work with coaches and mentors or, or consultants of any yeah, kind. It's because what small. you're doing is creating that very, very small community of two mm. where you both support each other in different ways. Really, the coach is doing more of the supporting because that's the relationship. But you're creating that support network so that people, again, have the resources to go away. So when they're not in that, network they still feel supported and resourced Mm. and it has a huge impact it's like a system right Mm. so you can't change one bit in the system without the rest of the system changing Mm. and I've definitely found when I have started to be that person of I am okay I can I am resourced like I can provide like I'm coming from a good place the people around me the friends I have the relationship I have totally changes because you believe it, they believe it. It's not necessarily believe, it's that I act on it well, as well. because yeah, you are it. I'm they doing it. it. I'm yeah. modelling the yeah, behaviour. Yeah, yeah. So if you have a friendship group where people aren't supporting each other, someone has to be the first one to do it. Mm. And it, I don't think it should be the person who is... If you had a pyramid and there's like kind of the one at the bottom who's feeling the shittiest, it shouldn't be them. It's too much pressure on that person to come up to that. If they're at the minus one, mm. it's too much pressure at them to be like plus one. Mm. But if someone's at zero and they can move to that plus one or they can become slightly more resourced or feel more confident, there's got to be someone in that group to be that first person. Like sometimes in a business context, I talk about like being the canary in the cage. Mm. You are the one who goes in and says, hey, guess what? It's, it's safe to be vulnerable. The air is safe to breathe. So this idea of like, well, well, it's like the thing where if you need help, don't say, can someone help? Point and say you. Because we all expect everyone else to be doing it. And it's about owning. And for me, it's about saying, look, actually, I'm in a place where I can embody how I would like this support, this system to be. I can embody how I want these com- this community to interact with each other. And it is tiring. Like nonviolent communication, it's tiring to be that person who says, when this happens, I feel this because of this need that I have. It is tiring. Or like when I'm teaching, it's tiring to be the one in the room who's saying, let's connect with each other. Yeah, it's tiring way. to force yourself out of bed to go and sit on a packed bus in the cold, wait there for ages, where people sneeze on you and open windows because they're too hot and blow freezing air in you and then go to some office where it's like it doesn't really make a difference if you're there or not Mm. like that's hard getting up and living within capitalism is hard Mm -hmm. so uh, why if if we're prepared to put the energy and investment into something that makes the majority of us miserable and poor why can't we put the energy and investment into something that actually improves our lives and makes things better for us why can't we have a return to community that isn't just let's nosy about what next door is doing and judge them like let's go, I go and help agree. them out i think and i completely agree I, I think one of the reasons that we are willing to put the energy into bullshit like the the thing of the getting on the bus and the yeah. office and the blah is because it is a model that is very clearly delineated that we understand that our that parents live through time. that we see yeah. whereas the model of like one of my clients i'm working with at the moment we went through the process of do you actually who have you had in your life who set a goal for themselves, been successful and been proud? And the number was zero. Mm. So we have to model all these behaviours. They're not from scratch. People exist who are doing this, but they are so rare in our lives mm. that we have to go through this like demanding process of going, 
not only am I trying to do it for myself, I'm being the like fucking blueprint for other people. So it's essentially, although it's depressing and miserable, it is easier to fit into a template than it is to make this new blueprint. But I completely agree. If you're willing to put that energy in and to be drowned in that miserable experience, if you take that energy and switch it into, okay, actually, how could I... You know, next time my friend says to me, oh, I'm starting a new project or I got a promotion, instead of feeling really fucking envious and cutting her down for it, how could I say, I'm so proud of you, I really support you, I love what you've done, I'd love to hear about it, and use that energy of being supported to know that your friend will then return that back to you. Because they will. But that, like, someone's got to be the first one and... Like, I'm happy to be that in what I do. Mm. I think a big thing is, like, if you are the person in your relationship, your friendship, your family, someone has to be the first one. And that includes setting good boundaries for yourself, includes requesting what you need. It's not just give, give, give. It's mm. about, not, like, being that whole, complete, abundant individual. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that and found something of value in it. I'm still very early in this process of learning as I go, including with the presenting and publishing. If you're listening to this and are interested in hearing more, you should be able to look forward to all of these episodes becoming more polished. That's it for now. Episode 2 is already available and more episodes will be dropping shortly. Okay, everyone take care and be safe.